This is Macro Voices, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Now let's get to that chart deck. Listeners, you're going to find the download link for the post game chart deck in your research roundup email. If you don't have a research roundup email, that means you have not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, and click on the red button over Tian's picture saying, looking for the downloads. Now, Eric, let's cover crude oil, starting with the EIA inventory. EIA printed an utterly massive build of 12 million barrels of crude oil, Cushing, Oklahoma, building 710,000 barrels. But that was offset by big drawdowns on finished products, with gasoline drawing down 3.7 million barrels and distillates drawing down 1.9 million barrels for a net petroleum build of 6.4 million barrels. U.S. production held steady at 13.3 million barrels. Looking at the April futures contract chart, the steep sell-off on Wednesday and reaction to that massive inventory build seems to suggest that this rally failed exactly where it did last time at the 34-week moving average. And at first glance, that seems to suggest, well, maybe we're headed back down to test the lows again. But I don't think so. The front-of-curve time spreads tend to be a much stronger indication of what the smartest professional oil traders think than the flat price chart is. And Wednesday was an extraordinary day in the sense that even in the face of that sharp sell-off on flat price, it still didn't pull the prompt spread back into Contango, nor did it collapse the subsequent spreads nearly as much as one would expect given the magnitude of the flat price sell-off. This tells me that the dumb money pan panicked and sold on the massive inventory build, thinking it would surely end the rally. But the smartest money, the professionals who trade the spreads rather than the front month, seem to disagree with them. So my guess is that this rally is set to resume as soon as the market shrugs off and digests that big inventory build. And a daily close over $79, that's the 34-week moving average where the last two rallies failed, would be a bullish signal suggesting that that rally is set to continue by much higher. Now, Eric, for me, for the last month, we've been seeing a pattern of accumulation in oil. Uh, We obviously, through the months of October, November, going into December, we're in an aggressive distribution cycle in oil that saw it shave it off almost $20 from top to the bottom. But we've seen a scenario where throughout late December into January, every dip was being bought. You know, there would be $3 down days and immediately reversing back up. And we see a lot of structural things like gasoline futures doing incredibly well in terms of uh, starting to break out of multi-month ranges. Uh, a lot of these things are showing uh, a more accumulative price action, which uh, is a, a good base from which uh, some sort of short-term rallies can begin. Now, we have had Anas on the show suggesting that oil has no big bull catalyst this year and i'm not against that view but i also don't think there's much stopping oil from trading towards the top end of last year's ranges in you know to the mid 80s to even nine uh, mid 90s uh, before coming right back down it's just a trade range kind of price action so in my mind uh, this dip that's coming in here in oil is really interesting because if we can hold above the 50 day and hold the retracement zones in the 75 dollar area and stay in this range, that might set up for that $79 breakout. And uh, I would not be shocked if uh, that sent us into the 80 to $85 range on the upside of oil. So I think uh, uh, looking for the bull breakout is something that's uh, on my mind. Though I want to move on here to equities and get Nick involved in the conversation. Now, Nick, before we talk the bigger picture of these uh, charts, well, let's start off with just looking at what levels you're watching. Yeah, Patrick. So right now the uh, SPX is sitting at a spot price of approximately 5,000, which is a key level. There's a call wall above at 5,100 and a put wall below at 4,800, which is near the previous all-time highs of 4,820. Now the implied move for the March 15th monthly OPEX is plus minus 130 points. Therefore, the implied upper move is 5,130 and the implied move lower is 4,870. Key resistance right now above is at all-time highs at 50-50 approximately. Uh, 
and key support below is at 4,900 roughly. I'm inclined to think we see a move lower over the next few weeks, especially after tomorrow's monthly OPEX for February. Uh, as volatility picks up, we saw a CPI come in a bit hotter than expected for January on Tuesday, and that caused us to have a move lower in markets, which were then bought up yesterday. But again, I think this will be very short-lived with earnings over now. Uh, also keep in mind that we have the next FOMC meeting just after the March monthly OPEX on uh, March 18th, 19th, I believe it is. So there should be volatility into that event as well. But uh, my key levels right now are upside, obviously, all-time high is 50-50. I think it's possible we push perhaps 5,100 at the highest point, but I do think we see some downside action toward 4,900. And if we get below that, a fast shot to 4,800. Yeah, those those are the levels that I think make a lot of sense. But uh, the real question to me, I kind of step back and try to understand what what condition we're in here. So we have an incredibly overbought market. I mean, at this stage in a, in 110 days or so, we've uh, traveled almost a thousand S and P points from a trough to peak, uh, and and that is a, a very overbought condition and and the typical length of t- of rallies. So the way I look at this is that this is a a very mature market that typically pauses and mean reverts. It doesn't have to be the big kahuna, the big bear market, but just rallies get checked and profit-taking cycles happen. But uh, with that said, the prevailing trend is intact. Uh, Higher highs, higher lows, dips being bought, price action is accumulative. Uh, And so trying to short this market is fighting the prevailing trend. One of the things that I feel that needs to be watched over the next week is when do we see this pattern change? When do we see the market fail to break to a higher high? When do we see a sell-off that uh, doesn't get fully recovered and bought on dip quickly? When does the the nature of the price action shift? Uh, And considering that we were gamma pinned throughout the week at this 5,000 level, I think uh, watching early uh, next week, uh, uh, you know, whether or not uh, a rally can stick. And more importantly, if we break below 4,900, they're going to be the the levels to watch. You were right about the 4,800 level. That's about where the 50-day moving average is, as well as the 50% retracement of uh, of the most recent rally. So uh, if we did see some short-term highs, that would be a very reasonable one-week target uh, for the downside. Um, what What levels are you watching on the NASDAQ? So on the queues right now, spot price is approximately 434. We have a call wall above at 440, also all-time highs, and a put wall below at 410, previous all-time highs. The implied move for the March 15th monthly OPEX is plus minus 16 points. Therefore, the upper implied move is 450, and the lower implied move is 418. Currently, resistance is above at all-time highs at 440, where the call wall resides, and key support is below at previous all-time highs at 410. Now, again, I'm inclined to think we see a, a decent pullback in some of these names. Um, the way I'm kind of viewing these mega caps now, you know, Amazon uh, in particular is as a conglomerate, right? It has so many different businesses now that it's almost like buying an uh, ETF in and of itself. However, there are names that I, I view as being very overvalued. NVIDIA, for example, is now worth more than Google, which I view as being absolutely absurd. So their earnings coming up pretty soon. And once that happens, we may see you know a pop higher or a drop lower, perhaps. That will likely guide the market and tech another direction. Yeah, the interesting thing there, Nick, is is that we're starting to see fewer and fewer of the Mag Sevens really leading the way. Now, of course, Nvidia is ripping very strongly, but you see stocks like uh, Tesla and Apple um, really being quite sluggish in their price action. And so, it's almost like the generals that were leading this bull market. And slowly, some of these generals are being shot, and there's fewer and fewer that are kind of pushing things forward. And we'll see whether or not the uh, the other ones can keep the momentum going to allow this market. It to still make a higher high. Uh, wanted to touch on volatility. For yesterday, um, we saw, or, or at least on the CPI day, we had that big spike in the VIX hitting the 18 handle, at least on an intraday basis. Uh, and was the first kind of uh, boogeyman moment from volatility spikes that we've seen in three months. Um, now, obviously, we've given it right back. We're back down to the 
Palpatine handle. But I, what I'm really going to be curious about now is uh, will we see new sustained higher levels of volatility or will this get right back down to the low teens uh, where we've been going and that this was just a fake out? With this kind of a move, uh, if we see more sustained periods above 15 is going to be signaling to me that um, there's a, a an appetite for hedging and uh, that low vol, low short gamma kind of condition is maybe unwinding a little bit. What, and what's your take on the VIX? So with the VIX right now at around a 14 level, we expect to see around 0.8% moves top to bottom intraday on SPX. On Tuesday, when we declined from that you know previous day of all-time highs on Monday, from 50, 48 or so, all the way down to 49.20 on Tuesday, we saw something very interesting happen. So call selling actually picked up heavily on the VIX because we had VIX expiration yesterday. And also put selling on SPX uh, occurred greatly at 49.20 as well. So that caused that short-term rally on Tuesday off that bottom. We, you know, we moved about 35 points or so in the span of less than an hour from 49.20 all the way up to a closing price of 49.55 or so. So right now we're seeing a lot of volatility selling still occurring as we spike up. So these small spikes are kind of being beaten down by volatility sellers. However, that doesn't necessarily forebode that we will keep volatility suppressed. We may expand beyond what's expected, and that can actually cause a lot more market pain and a lot more volatility because as short option sellers are pushed to cover their positions, that will cause a lot of movement in other directions. So anyways, moving on to page seven, we have the US dollar index. What are your thoughts here? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that I think the single most important issue in finance in 2024 is going to be figuring out the Fed's true intentions in this election year. When the long-awaited Fed pivot finally came, it was painfully clear that they had been influenced by someone or something. Just a week earlier, Jay Powell had said almost the opposite. Then suddenly it changed. And then when the dot plot predicted three rate cuts starting later this year, the market instantaneously jumped to the conclusion that they were just downplaying their real intentions, so markets began discounting six or seven rate cuts starting in March. I said at the time that the market was getting ahead of itself. Well, the rubber just hit the road in the form of Tuesday's CPI print coming in hot. That's the exact trigger that Jay Powell has said in the past would cause the Fed to pause and maybe even further delay any rate cutting. And who knows, maybe even move towards some actual monetary tightening in order to fight inflation that looks like it's rearing its ugly head again and maybe isn't quite as under control as everyone was assuming. Of course, then again, it was not that big of a miss, only a tenth of a percent on the CPI that got everybody so upset about the, the hot print. So maybe it's not a big deal. But hang on a second. Our good friend Jim Bianco at Bianco Research has a tweet thread out this week saying Jim thinks that inflation has just bottomed and will increase from here. So I think Jay Powell is perhaps about to be tested. I predict that he knows in his heart of hearts that if inflation picks back up, the Fed should abandon its cut plans and make a clear announcement to the market that the cuts are coming off the table because the data has changed. But that would likely be political suicide for Jay Powell in this election year. My point is simply that it's not possible for us to know how the Fed will react to data that should cause them to resume tightening until that data actually hits the tape and they're forced to make that decision. And I have a nagging feeling that that's coming soon. So where the dollar, gold, and most other asset classes go from here is going to depend on the extent to which the Fed is political versus staying true to its mission of infighting inflation, which would suggest abandoning the rate cuts if inflation has in fact bottomed and is about to move higher, as Jim Bianco is suggesting. Patrick and I both said last week that if the Dixie moved over 104.5, that would be the signal that a new move higher on the dollar index is upon us. Now, that's exactly what happened on Tuesday in reaction to the hot CPI print. But look, that was a knee-jerk reaction to an unexpected surprise in data. So there's room for it to reverse back to the downside if the market thinks that the data was wrong. In other words, if the market thinks that CPI isn't really bottoming and isn't about to move higher. But there's also room for a move higher to accelerate quickly if the market comes around to Jim Bianco's view that inflation perhaps has already bottomed and is about to move much higher. 
unless, that is, inflation is headed higher, but the Fed is going to cut anyway in order to placate the White House. And of course, that would cause inflation to accelerate even more. My real point is that politics, more than market fundamentals, are going to drive the dollar, and we don't yet know what Jay Powell is made of when push comes to shove, and he is perhaps about to be forced to choose between political pressures and doing what he knows the Fed should do in reaction to changing data, if it's changing, which isn't completely clear quite yet. Right now, we're in the moment of suspended animation as the market tries to digest the CPI print and decide what it means and what comes next. I expect the Dixie to either retrace hard to the downside if the market decides to write off the CPI print as an anomaly, or else accelerate quickly to the upside if the market comes around to Jim Bianco's view that inflation has already bottomed and is starting to move higher. This will happen quickly. If we close on Friday with the Dixie over 105, it's probably the beginning of a new move much higher, and we'll have to reevaluate everything at that point. But let's not write off the possibility of a downside retracement. This is time to listen very carefully to messaging from the Fed for cues as to how they intend to navigate what could be a fierce battle between heeding White House demands that they're theoretically immune from versus doing what they've actually been tasked with doing. Eric, I get it with the political risks and uh, elections coming in being a big variable. But to me, um, I look at it even a little bit bigger picture because what is really driving the U.S. dollar strength? And uh, what we see is uh, a lot of the big economies around the world outside of the U.S. are very weak. We just uh, saw a recession print in um, Japan. We saw a recession print in the U.K. and uh, the Europe. European economy is weaker than the U.S. economy. And so uh, the U.S. is the um, cleaner, dirty shirt in this scenario, which is causing flows and and money is coming into the United States based on uh, a stronger economy. This is keeping that U.S. dollar strong. I mean, the the U.S. dollar yen is uh, now above the 150 level, retesting those uh, October, November highs. And so uh, while there are the political drivers and the Fed, uh, the interest interesting part is, uh, will the U.S. dollar just simply play the global safe haven asset? And uh, what are the intermarket implications for that? Uh, I uh, look at this break of the 104.5 level as uh, as significant. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see uh, whether or not the U.S. dollar uh, builds on that or whether it fades. Uh, I, uh, I still think generally uh, the U.S. dollar has lots of room to be strong uh, throughout the uh, first half of the year. And moving on to pages eight and nine, Eric, you wanted to add in a couple of gold charts here. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts. There can be no doubt that the hot CPI print on Tuesday was the cause of the big down week on gold. As I've said so many times before, I think 2024 is likely to be the year that gold will break out to new all-time highs. But it's all about the dollar and the timing of the Fed cuts. And now we're seeing signs that inflation may be bottoming and that this might not be the last hotter than expected inflation print. We don't know that conclusively yet, nor do we know whether the Fed will respond by tightening or if they'll stay the course on rate cuts just for political reasons in an election year. The point is, the possible outcomes for gold are all over the map on a fundamental analysis level. Inflation getting worse from here, but the Fed cutting anyway for the sake of appeasing the White House, is the most bullish scenario imaginable for gold. But if inflation starting to return causes the Fed to publicly announce an intention to change course on monetary policy and abandon its plans to cut rates, well, that would suggest that we've got a horribly bearish outcome ahead of us for gold. And the technical signal is even more confused. I've included two separate gold charts in this week's slide deck. The first is the continuous futures contract chart, which really doesn't look all that bad considering that we're speaking in the wake of an unexpectedly hot CPI print. The market is still above both the 100 and 200 day moving averages on that chart. The 200 day is the amber line and its label is obscured on this chart by the volume weighted moving average at the same level, which is covering over the label on the 200 day. Both of them are at about 1980, 1980 on the price scale. 
This chart is showing a market that seems to be starting to bounce off its 100-day moving average with the slow stochastics bottoming at the same time. In other words, this chart could be showing the beginning of a price reversal, about to move the market back up and retrace higher. But when contango is steep in the futures market, the continuous and contract charts don't always tell the same story. And in such cases, most futures traders will tell you that the front month contract chart will give the better technical analysis cues. So let's also look at the second gold chart in the deck, which is the April delivery contract chart. This chart looks absolutely dreadful. Tuesday's move in reaction to CPI decisively took out both the 100 and 200 day moving averages to the downside, leaving no obvious support immediately below the market. That could spell the beginning of an ominous move much lower, which would be entirely consistent with a fundamental view that inflation has already bottomed and the Fed is about to abandon its rate cutting plans. Another $100 of downside wouldn't be at all out of the question in that scenario. So once again, the signals are numerous and conflicting. If you're still convinced that the big theme of 2024 in terms of monetary policy will be a program of rate cuts from the Fed, then the continuation chart will rationalize that view for you. And it looks like this is actually a buy here because, well, we're right at the bottom of the horizontal consolidation range, having just retested the January swing low and almost retesting the December swing low. But if the Fed is about to abandon its rate-cutting plans because inflation isn't really under control after all, well, then in that case, the usually more reliable contract chart is showing you a breakdown below support that could be just the beginning of a big price move much lower. I don't know which it is, nor do I think anyone else does. It's not just a question of whether inflation is really under control. The bigger and more important question is whether the Fed would abandon its rate-cutting plans in that scenario, or if they would stay the course for the sake of keeping the economy and markets goosed up through the election season. And we won't know that answer until we see the Fed's next move. Well, Eric, certainly if we see uh, a scenario where um, the expectations of a a first half of the year Fed interest rate cut gets uh, pulled back and it's really a second half of the year story, that certainly is going to be a drag on gold, which was really, you know, had a a very strong impulse based upon the idea that the easing cycle was imminent. Uh, With that said, of course, there is always room for gold to head down towards a dip toward 1950 or 1900 where it traded through uh, much of last year but uh, I wouldn't it wouldn't change my bigger view that it's just one big buy on dip and that gold is going much higher uh, so the question now is really uh, do we go through some sort of a short term pullback cycle where a one month pullback of a, a 50 or 100 uh, dollars an ounce uh, offers a much more compelling buying opportunity like let's say come April or May it's uh, certainly the thing that uh, we are watching on the short term, it's trading below its 50-day moving average. Uh, and so it is in some sort of a consolidation corrective mode. And, uh, and so right now we have to respect that as the short-term prevailing trend. Moving on, I wanted to just touch, though, on page 11 on the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. And what we had was obviously a quick drop from 5% all the way down to 380 over the course of just several months in what was just an amazing bond rally. Uh, And we really spent um, the entire first, uh, you know, six weeks of the year consolidating that in that trade range established between four and a quarter to 380. And, um, And what we really saw here was a breakout now consolidating at higher levels so yields clearly have uh, um, come under pressure and are pressing higher as uh, inflation boogeyman starts to kind of rear its head here the bigger question in my mind is this sending the 10-year treasury yield back to october highs near five percent and for me i'm still a seller on that idea while sure inflation uh, will re-emerge and maybe it will be a little bit stronger than the disinflationary impulse that we've saw but i don't think that that drives much higher inflation expectations that have already been in many ways priced in over the last two three years and so uh, i don't think we're going back to five percent but it will it be a shocker to me if we uh, print 440 450 uh, on the upside not really so on the short term uh, yields may get a little pressure on that upside 
Folks, if you enjoy Patrick's chart decks, you can get them every single day of the week with a free trial of Big Picture Trading. The details are on the last pages of the slide deck, or just go to BigPictureTrading.com. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>